it looks like since everyone's kind of petering in, we'll go ahead and start. Um, my name is Kirk Sigmund, the president of the Federal Society here, and we are very proud to present uh, Mr. Jordan Lorenz from the Alliance Defense Fund. Um, he is here to speak to us predominantly about his work with the case uh, for the Bronx Board of Education involving the um, right of a, of a religious entity to basically use public uh, services, I suppose. So he'll explain more to you, but let's give him a round of applause. The, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me up here. And uh, I, sorry, I knocked the sign over. Uh, I, I work for the Alliance Defense Fund down in their Washington, D.C. office. Uh, mainly because uh, I have the privilege of working uh, on a lot of our cases that get uh, up at the Supreme Court. And so, for example, uh, we did uh, we uh, did a lot of work on the Christian Legal Society case. We were uh, representing the parties in the Arizona tuition tax credit case, which we had the argument that one that the uh, uh, ACLU's taxpayers lack standing to challenge a tax credit uh, that the Supreme Court decided last, uh, I believe it was in March. And uh, we've had a case going on for about, uh, uh, either depending on how you uh, slice this, either from 1994 or since 2001, uh, involving a small church called Bronx Household of Faith. And the issue is whether a church or other religious group can rent a government building on the weekend, in this case a school when no kids are there and no students uh, are there for the regular school day, for a worship service. So uh, I'm going to speak for maybe about 15-20 uh, minutes and I'll take any questions that you have about this case. Uh, we're going to be appealing this case to the Supreme Court uh, and uh, it has been going on but I want you to know that for nine years, we've had an injunction in effect that have allowed religious groups to meet on the same terms and conditions as everybody else. And the Second Circuit, by a two to one vote in June, overturned that permanent injunction. So let me just give you a little description about the New York City School Board, the school district, and, uh, and its policies for community groups renting school facilities. New York City, as you would guess, is the largest school system in terms of number of pupils in the country. It has almost just under 1,200 school buildings in the city. And under its policy, during non-school hours on the weeknights and weekdays, it allows community groups to meet for social, civic, recreational meetings and entertainments and other uses pertaining to the welfare of the community. Now, in any given year, they have over 10,000 users that uh, meet during that time. And the policy expressly states that it expects its facilities to be used for these types of purposes. And this is a quote from their policy. Tenant groups, taxpayer associations, drama clubs, local merchant associations, senior citizens groups, local chapters of tax-exempt organizations, youth groups, Boy and Girl Scouts, Little League, Teen Clubs, Labor Unions, Professional Societies, Private Social Service Agencies, and local YMCA's and settlement houses. And I have to admit, I don't know what a settlement house is. But whatever it is, they're allowed to meet there in the public schools. But there are a few things that it, in this very broad forum that it is set up that it bans. And it says this. No permit shall be granted for the purpose of holding religious worship services or otherwise using a school as a house of worship. And that's the policy that's been in contention and which we will be, uh, have before the Supreme Court for their consideration probably within the next few months. So, who is the plaintiff in this case? Bronx Household of Faith is a small evangelical church that was started by two pastors and their wives back in 1971. And it was their belief to uh, go start a church in a very poor area of New York, so they moved to the University Heights area of the Bronx and started their church. And they began by meeting and you know, just all moving there and uh, beginning to meet people in the community. And they met in houses for uh, many years then moved to a, a bigger house that they had bought that served as a halfway house for uh, 
uh, men who were in prison and transitioning uh, into regular life after they had served their prison terms, and that had a larger room that they could meet in. But as their, as their church population got up to 100, 125, they said, this is just uh, too much. And they asked to meet. They had two schools uh, within a couple of blocks of where they met in New York City. They said, can we meet in the school? And the school official said no because of this policy. So we filed a lawsuit against uh, New York City in 1995. We lost at the district court. We lost at the Second Circuit in 1997. We did a cert petition in 1998, and it was cert denied. So you're thinking, well, why is this case still going on? Well, it basically laid dead in the ground for about three years until the Supreme Court had a case called Good News Club. And as you're familiar with the, the Supreme Court practices that they, uh, they deal with issues when there is a circuit split, when the circuits are in conflict, the federal appeals courts, on a certain issue. And they listed this 1997 Second Circuit decision as being on the wrong side of the circuit split that they resolved. So we were able to escape the, uh, the chains of race judicata and collateral estoppel and refile the lawsuit uh, in uh, September of 2001. In fact, it's kind of eerie that uh, our pleadings are dated September 11, 2001. And uh, we, we filed it, and uh, as many of you may know, that we're in the Southern District of New York, which is not that far from the World Trade Center. And uh, the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center has rendered everything chaotic. Uh, down there with the, with the phones, and, and, and basically it took about six weeks. Uh, we'd asked for a preliminary injunction hearing before we could even get into contact with the judge's uh, chambers. Uh, Loretta Presco is now the chief judge of the, of the Southern District of New York. Um, we had a preliminary injunction hearing, and the judge basically reversed herself. She had been the same judge who had rejected our arguments back in 1995. And this time, she issued a, per, a preliminary injunction, which was upheld by the Second Circuit. She converted that into a permanent injunction, which took a long time to get that through and then get up to the Second Circuit. And that was overturned by the Second Circuit on a two-to-one vote uh, in this, just this last June. And essentially, what the Second Circuit said was this. Well, even though this is private speech that's religious, we think that it is reasonable for this New York City School District to be concerned about the Establishment Clause. Even though there's not a real Establishment Clause violation here, but just the concern about it will be enough to uh, allow them <coughs> to gerrymander their form, of course they didn't use that word, to exclude the uh, churches. Now they also had a very strange thing where they said, now, if a religious group wants to have a meeting where they engage in singing, prayer, uh, people sharing about their faith, uh, a, 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 an exhortation, a speech where uh, someone uh, uh, discusses a biblical passage, that would be okay. You can have all those component parts in a meeting the trigger is, though, if you call it a worship service, then it's like the buzzer sounds and, and you're out, and you, you can't meet. So they basically said the label that the religious group uses to apply is the definitive thing that determines whether you have access to the form or not. We uh, appealed this for uh, rehearing on Bach, and the Second Circuit at the end of July uh, rejected that, and we're now uh, preparing our cert petition, which I have been deep into working on this. And I think that this is clearly wrong in a number of points. And just to go through them uh, quickly and, and take your, your questions. And the first thing that this, that although the Second Circuit acknowledges this kind of with its lips, it gives lip service to the fact that this is private speech, it doesn't really comprehend the significance of this. So to state a very basic principle of constitutional law is that only the government can violate the Constitution. It's a restraint on state action. So if you don't have state action, 
you don't have a violation of the Constitution. So uh, even though this is a worship service, this is in no way endorsed or sponsored by the New York City Board of Education. This is simply a private group uh, desiring to have access to uh, a government building on the same terms and conditions as everybody else. But the Establishment Clause keeps, ex it keeps <coughs> uh, intruding into this case uh, like an uninvited guest that won't leave the party. Uh, there is no government sponsorship here, so therefore the Establishment Clause should not be a concern, but it keeps getting raised up. And the fact that this is private speech, which is protected by the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clauses, doesn't seem to be important. Now, the Supreme Court has clearly made, made this distinction between state-sponsored religious speech and private speech. So, for example, in the Mergen's case back in 1990, Senator Day O'Connor wrote for the majority, there is a crucial difference between government endorsing religion, which the Establishment Clause forbids, and private speech endorsing religion, which the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clauses protect. This distinction gets lost in the Second Circuit's analysis. And in fact, at one point, they're quoting the Ten Commandment cases, where uh, you know, a, a county in Kentucky and then the state of Texas had Ten Commandment monuments as somehow relevant to explain this, when those are clearly government-sponsored religious speech, which triggers Establishment Clause inquiry. Here, there shouldn't be this government accommodation of freedom of speech of individuals, of private religious speech does not violate the Establishment Clause. Then, uh, so the Free Speech Clause really gets us to the right answers here. But the Supreme Court, I, I'm sorry, but the Second Circuit doesn't seem to want to follow the lead of the Supreme Court, which at least seven decisions have said, when you have a government forum open for private groups to speak, the fact that some of them are engaging in religious speech does not violate the Establishment Clause. So uh, the government doesn't endorse every speaker that it allows into a forum like this. Yet, uh, even though there's 10,000 users out of 1,200 school buildings each year, New York City thinks that the 60 or so churches and then a few more other non-Christian religious groups somehow are endorsed by the, uh, by the government, by the, by the school district. But that is simply not the case. Um, then there is also this kind of strange thing where they say that worship services can be carved out and excluded. Uh, and they, they say that they depend upon the goodwill of the religious groups to be honest that they're engaged in a worship service. Well, one of the questions is, is, what if it's a religious group that doesn't define a worship service to be something that includes singing or reciting a liturgy, uh, hearing uh, a speech, having prayer? Uh, for example, uh, the Seventh Circuit in a similar case said, what about the Quakers? The Quakers simply when they have their meetings, get together and wait for the Holy Spirit to quake them. And the, they, and the Holy Spirit can quake them in all sorts of different ways. Uh, it could be to give a speech or to sing a song together or whatever, to pray together about something, or a combination of those things. But the worship service of the Quakers does not fit this. Now, we also have, and this is just some of the discovery we did in this, uh, these were requests and some of the users uh, request to use uh, the school facilities in New York. There was the Goshen Temple asked, and what was the purpose of their meeting? They put temple and concert. Well, is that a worship service or not? Hope of Israel, fellowship meeting, uh, Ananiah Ministries, gospel shows, uh, the Ching High Association, meditation exercises. Is that a worship service or not? And I'm bringing these up as examples to show that they're going to have to have a theologian on staff at the New York City School Board to inquire as to what these are. Uh, the Buddhist mission 
had a robe offering ceremony. I don't know what that is. Now, if they said to the Buddhist, is this a worship service? They may say yes, they may say no. But what I think what they would do is they would ask, well, what do you do in your ceremony? And, and listen to it to see if it sounds like a worship service or not. Some of the groups that are clearly religious had things such as meetings, assembly, um, celebration. Well, are those worship services or not? But now what we do know is getting back to their policy, they permit all types of users that do anything that pertains to the welfare of the society, uh, of, the, of the community, which I think uh, what Bronx Household of Faith is doing, trying to build this inner city church would do, uh, is doing that. Now, the Supreme Court, I thought, has answered this question and said, you view these cases fundamentally as freedom of speech cases, you reject this establishment clause notion that you have to single out the religious users and exclude them, but New York City said, doesn't view it that way. And, and uh, the Second Circuit validated it. Now, it had some specific concerns under the Establishment Clause. One of them is domination of the form, that they point out to the fact that uh, when these churches rent the buildings for a couple of hours on a Sunday morning, they usually rent the auditorium, maybe the cafeteria, and a half dozen or so classrooms for their Sunday school. And they say that this is domination of the form. And in some earlier cases, the Supreme Court has never really fleshed this out. They've said domination of the form would be grounds to uh, exclude a religious group. But on closer examination, I think that this really falls apart. So, for example, that they said uh, uh, that, um, and I, want to, I just want to get to the statistics here. There are only 60 churches meeting on a regular basis in almost 1,200 school buildings. And even if you take every user, whether they're religious, and the vast majority of these users are not religious, on Friday nights, uh, there are only 450 buildings being used. Now, sometimes those are only one room. So you can have multiple people meeting simultaneously. Saturdays, out of the 1,200 buildings, 800 of them have some user in at least part of the building. And Sundays, only 300 are used. So there is no domination of the form. And in some of these, for example, like on uh, just picking at random, the Friday night ones uh, of the approximately 207, I'm sorry, 2,717 permits issued during the 2004 year, they had uh, 13 religious groups using them on Friday nights that could, in, in any way could be argued to be worshipped. Six of them were Buddhist, six of them were Christian, and one of them was Jewish. And in fact, in one of the buildings, they had two churches meeting simultaneously in the same building. So this domination of the form argument is simply not correct. Okay, one of the other establishment clause arguments that they use is that uh, there are impressionable youth that can be confused if churches are meeting in their schools. Now the big problem with that that they have is that no one, none of the schools are used for public school on Sunday mornings. But what they'll point out is, well, like, what if the kid is walking by with his parents and sees a sign that says XYZ Church, sun, you know, meets here Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I mean, they only put up the signs temporarily on the Sunday mornings. Well, a couple of things. First, the Supreme Court has said in the Good News Club case, that we decline to employ the Establishment Clause jurisprudence as a modified heckler's veto to protect the impressionable youth. Because the impressionable youth argument, the Supreme Court said in the Good News Club case, cuts both ways. If you say everybody can meet here except the churches or other religious groups, you send a message to the, uh, to the impressionable youth there's something dangerous about these religious groups. They're kind of like anthrax or, or you know, asbestos in the ceiling tiles. And you have to exclude them from the public schools so nobody gets you know, infected or contaminated or something like that. And then how far does this go to protect impressionable youth? What if a child goes to a church somewhere or a synagogue 
and sees his or her teacher worshiping there, would that cause confusion? Oh, this must be the school district's synagogue because there's my third grade teacher there worshiping. Now, obviously, at some point they say, well, look, the individual teacher has the right to worship, and the, and the way we deal with the confused kids is explaining to them um, the, the teachers are not on duty all the time, and they have First Amendment rights to worship, and it doesn't mean anything at all. Now, also, under their policy, um, the one thing that I want to point out, too, is that the confusion issue, I think, is much broader than what they're saying. Under the policy, for example, if somebody wanted to have a, do a speech in a public school on, don't vaccinate your kids because vaccinations are dangerous, that would fly in the face of school board policy and state law that children had to be vaccinated. But they couldn't exclude them. And if somebody said, well, I'm confused, or, or why are you allowing somebody that contradicts uh, school policy to speak, they'd say, hey, we live in a free society, this is a private individual that's not connected with the school, and sometimes we have to accommodate and tolerate speech we don't agree with. I, I think that would be the right answer, and why can this not go to the schools? Now, there will also be things brought up like, well, the churches meet every Sunday, year in and year out, and, and you know, and you know, this sort of thing, and it's, it's, well, their policy allows groups to meet weekly, year in and year out. The Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts have met for decades in New York City public schools, and there's no pressure that they are somehow the official youth groups or something like that of the school district. One of the ar other arguments that they have made is that there is, um, this is an illegal or an unconstitutional subsidy of religion. And they'll point, and they'll say something like this. Well, if uh, Bronx Household the Faith was to uh, rent a ballroom at, uh, you know, the Ritz-Carlton or the Plaza, it would, it would cost them a zillion dollars every Sunday to do that. And the cost to get a permit to meet in the New York City public schools is much less. So the difference between the Ritz-Carlton and uh, the school, that amounts to a subsidy of religion. Now, I think conceptually, not only has the Supreme Court rejected this concept, but I think it's illogical on, uh, it for several reasons. First. The school district sets the rate, that the fee for getting the permit. It, this isn't like uh, the, some churches have you know, bamboozled the school district. Also, this is the permit rate that everybody pays. If you're the Boy Scouts, if you're a labor union, if you're a, having a piano recital, you pay the exact same permit rate. Or, I mean, there may be different rates depending on how many rooms you get, but the schedule is uniform for everybody. It, there's no difference uh, between them. So it would be like, for example, if uh, there was a new Jewish synagogue in New York City and it hooked up to the uh, sewer system and somebody said, well, that's an illegal subsidy or an unconstitutional subsidy of Judaism because they didn't have to build their own sewer system. Uh, or if a fire department puts out a fire at the Buddhist monastery, oh, well, they... They didn't have to hire their own private fire department, so this is a government subsidy. Well, I think it's hard to argue that the concept of subsidy has to be uh, at least somewhat limited to a certain privileged group of people. If everybody gets the same subsidy, I don't think it's really a subsidy at all. And the Supreme Court has rejected this argument by saying, <coughs> in, in several cases, and here's one from Widmar versus Vincent in 1981, that if this subsidy argument were accurate, then it would mean that a church could not be protected by the police and fire departments or have its public sidewalks kept in repair. And I think that that's exactly right. Uh, yet, this was an argument that the, that the Second Circuit, every one of these arguments about impressionable youth, uh, about uh, the subsidies, about domination of the form, they said that these were legitimate interests that New York City could use to, um, 
to exclude worship services from the public schools. Now, I would just add one point, and I'm just going to wrap this up here. Is that we did some investigation this summer on the 50 top school districts in the country in terms of population. Now, New York City is, of course, number one. But no other school district among the top 50 have a policy anything like this. They all allow private groups to rent school facilities on weekends for worship services. So all these concerns that New York City has are not shared by Philadelphia or Boston or Los Angeles or Chicago or Dade County or on and on and on. Uh, we could not find <clears throat> another school district in the top 50 that had a policy anywhere near this. So in closing, I'd like to read the words of Justice Brennan, who wrote in 1978. I think the accurate way to view this, that to, to view these cases fundamentally as freedom of speech cases or free exercise cases, and, and not have a hyperactive extreme view of the Establishment Clause to single out these religious users. Justice Brennan wrote, the Establishment Clause does not license government to treat religion and those who teach or practice it simply by virtue of their status as such, as subversive of American ideals and therefore subject to unique disabilities. We are filing the cert petition, I think, sometime right before, right after Thanksgiving. We'll know whether cert is going to be granted or not, and whether the, the religious groups can continue meeting in the schools, or they'll be out uh, by the end of the year. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Two questions or observations and questions. First is, um, was, was the point pressed of disparate impact of these policies and how that how that excluding the, the church from being able to use these buildings is having a greater impact on them than say other religious groups because of the, you know their financial standing. You know that not everybody can afford to you know, own their own building in New York City. Right. Knows I can. Well, we, we made that argument, but where disparate impact has come in has been kind of the opposite way, where they'll say, uh, Muslim groups, uh, is, is my understanding, is uh, uh, traditionally meet uh, during the day on Fridays when the schools are in session. And, um, and then there's a lot of school, there's a lot of uh, school use of its own buildings on Friday nights and Saturdays. So there's limited use, although not they're not the Jewish groups are not excluded, and there are Jewish groups that use it. The availability is less, and that the greatest availability is on Sunday morning, and that happens to be when churches meet. So aha, this is a disparate impact that helps churches. And and I, I just simply say, look, they make this the pop the policy says it's available during non-school hours. And there are Every stripe of religious group uses them. And um, I, I just don't think that that justifies a policy that says, well, because we can't accommodate Muslims meeting during Fridays, we have to exclude everybody to be fair. I mean, this is a policy for non-school hours. I, mean, I just think that you just say, when it's open, you can use it, and if, you know, if you can't, you can't. But the type of argument that has not really been pressed the, the way that you put it. I mean, that's basically, you know, you can, you can shape any kind of policy basically to be a Jim Crow law based on that, yeah. more or less. Right. Second, so, uh, second part is, is the, sorry, I was at Penn State the answer. <laughs> so, um, the Second Circuit's um, analysis went, um, when they said that the city has a right to be concerned, not tippy-toeing anywhere near establishment, right. that seems to be a, a rational basis for you rather than the strict scrutiny view that, you know, that First Amendment yes. issues are entitled to. Was that brought up? And the fact that, I mean, that they, you, you can't have some, that low of a bar, per se, you know, for any, for any kind of judicial inquiry on the matter whatsoever. Yes, and the Second Circuit basically just rebuffed our efforts to raise this. And we're making a bigger point of this in the in the, uh, uh, in the uh, cert petition. And for two on two di for two different ways, we're arguing at least two that I can think of right off the top of my head, where they need to have strict scrutiny and a compelling state interest. One of them is is their form is very broad. Yeah. 
that they basically allow everybody to speak on any subject. They have very few limitations. And what, they're, what the Second Circuit has said is that because we exclude one thing, worship services, we have a limited form, so therefore all we have to do is show that it's reasonable and viewpoint neutral. So the Second Circuit said, yeah, we agree with that. And they exclude all the worship groups, all the religions, so it's, it's, a, it's viewpoint neutral. It's, it's a content-based one. But this is like Widmar. I think that they cannot, they don't really have a limited form. The other thing that we brought in uh, is most of these cases are not resolved on free exercise grounds. But we're saying the government does not have unlimited and unfettered authority to define the form however it wants. So it can't say if it excludes religious users because they're speaking about religious things, that exclusion has to be justified by a compelling state interest. Now, I'm not sure the Supreme Court's going to go for that or not, but we want to show that, hey, you guys, you don't have unlimited discretion just to do whatever you feel like, and all you have to do is say, oh, it's reasonable. Like, then, then you're, that's a very low standard, as, as you're saying. Now, I agree with that. Other questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. In terms of the uh, domination of forum, you said there, there are 1,200 schools? Yes. Is that is for is it fair to define form as twelve hundred schools? Shouldn't it be just the you know the, the regional school in the Bronx or the, the, the immediate Bronx area that they're using the schools in that area and not expect you know uh, be able to use you know, schools well, in Manhattan or in, in Staten Island? Th this is what I I think that that argument possibly could be uh, the point that you're making possibly could be valid in a different geographical school district. But, uh, so for example, and in fact, I didn't bring the statistics with me, but we built this out kind of, I, I do remember one thing, that, but this is a little more minuscule, is that in the house where uh, Bronx Hustle was meeting, if they went two blocks this way, there was a school, and if they went two blocks this way, there was a school. And they had their pick of which one, and they basically picked the newer one uh, to meet in. Uh, so if somebody said, we want to meet there, they could meet because they're, they're not using every room. But they also, I just think in New York City especially, you know, public schools in New York City are almost like Starbucks. There's one on every corner. And, and uh, the same policy applies to all the buildings uh, and that uh, they're still underutilized. And there's never been a situation where uh, there has been a a, especially for Sunday mornings, where somebody said, hey, I really want to meet in the exact same building that a certain church is meeting in, but we can't meet there because they're, they're using up all the space. So I think it's somewhat of a, of a contrived uh, dispute that might, you know, like you had some rural school district that covered a large geographic area and there was only like a half dozen school buildings that were separated by 10 miles or something like that. Possibly that might be an argument. But I think in New York City, it's just, it, it's just not. And, and we built out, and I wish I could remember the statistics, that if you went, you know, like a, an eighth of a mile, a quarter of a mile, I mean, it was just, uh, there'd be like 50 school buildings. And, and uh, you know, it's, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a large, large number. It wasn't, you know, that, uh, uh, there's a lot of underutilized and unutilized uh, states in the New York City schools. Yes, sir. Question. Was, have there been any other religious entities who have similarly been rejected from using these, uh, these facilities? Do you have any kind of comparison to be able to establish fairness in this, in this process of exclusion? Oh, you mean do they have they have they, have they, have they oh, else? Now. Yeah, everybody else got excluded before we filed the lawsuit, huh? and and there would be, uh, uh, I mean, like for example, is is we have the high holy days of Judaism approaching, that uh, many of the synagogues would rent uh, school facilities because they would have greater numbers and exceed the capacity of their synagogues. So they would not use them weekly, but you know annually uh, uh, for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, they they ran out auditoriums, and and, it, and those would be excluded before. Uh, I mean, even if there was a even if there was a 
fire that destroyed a, a religious, uh, you know, some temple or synagogue or church or whatever, they would not allow, even temporarily, while it was being rebuilt, you could not be in a public school. That this policy was applied very harshly, and uh, and I, I just think it's just unwarranted. That there's just they really have no legitimate reason to do this. Now the other thing that I would add too is that uh, uh, what, do these churches hang around forever? And the first thing I'd say is their policy does not require you to leave after a certain amount of time. So like I mentioned, the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts have been there for decades and nobody's left. But most of these churches, uh, and we have put evidence in the record, um, this is viewed as basically a temporary, even if it's over a multiple, you know, like five years or something like that, for them to build up their congregation, get enough money to, to get their own facility. And that after a while, it does not serve them very well to pack up and, and, and you know, put everything up, pack up, you know, store it somewhere, bring it back. Uh, uh, if there's uh, anything that closes the facility, like when the hurricane uh, a couple of weeks ago, they closed all the public schools, they had to find somewhere else to meet, all of that. They, it, it's hard to do spontaneous events, that sort of thing. So this is not an ideal situation for them. It is basically an interim step uh, for them. And, and, uh, and I think them, uh, you know, just sort of um, just uh, staying forever is really not realistic. And plus, they allow people to stay forever. So other questions? Yes, sir. Jack. And they were to rule against your side. Um, what do you see as the ripple effect of that? How is that going to affect not only New York schools, but maybe schools in the country? Well, I think what you would have is the New York City, and I forgot to mention this, the New York City policy is based on a state law, Education Law 414, that oddly enough does not bar religious worship services. If, if you were to you know, call it up on Westlaw and read it, you'd say, this doesn't ban this. But there was a a, uh, an intermediate appellate court decision in 1977 called Treatly by the state intermediate appellate court that said, well, this has got to be a ban on worship services because that can't be right. I mean, like you couldn't, like, oh, that, that can't be right. Sort of this kind of this different era of you know, where they had a greater sense of uh, or, or their, their concept of separation of church and state was much greater than I think what the Supreme Court recognized today, or I think what the what the you know what the establishment clause was intended to really uh, limit. Um, so it's this sort of judicial gloss on the statute. So New York State schools would probably continue to exclude it, and I think other school districts around the country would probably start looking at this. Although I think this would still be somewhat discretionary. Now, what will be interesting about this case is the Second Circuit basically said, uh, although I'm putting it too strongly as I put this, we don't see, they said something like, we don't really see a violation of the Establishment Clause here, but we think it's a legitimate concern. New York City, though, and I'm, I'm curious to see whether they will argue response, they feel that they are required by the Establishment Clause to have this policy, uh, which, which I think the Supreme Court has clearly said they don't. Uh, but but that will that will kind of uh, raise the ante, raise the stakes of this case if they argue that this is not only a legitimate like the establishment clause permits this policy, it requires this policy. Because then it would mean that every one of these other 49 school districts and others uh, that permit churches and other religious groups to meet, those would all be unconstitutional. But I, I just can't imagine the Supreme Court allowing that. But I mean, you know, they can deny serve and we'll just have to deal with it as it comes up. Yes, ma'am. Entire school to use it as pretty 
church functioning as a synagogue or a church every Sunday morning, um, you know, where like really what you're doing is you're sort of like transforming the entire school into a house of worship. Because you said, you know, a lot of these groups will rent out like an auditorium plus a cafeteria plus some classrooms and Sunday school. I mean, do you, I guess to me like that that does make the argument a little bit different when you're using the entire school as that because you are turning it into a, into a church or into a synagogue or, you know. And so do you kind of see, or it's, you know, is there like a distinction there to be made? Well, if, I, I think that uh, uh, this is an argument that the city has made. And uh, that I would stress that they, they rent these, they, they use these buildings for two to three hour, uh, let, let's say it's three or four hours on a Sunday morning. And there's something kind of spooky about where, where they say transform this into a, you know, into a house of worship. And that, you know, that kind of is a, kind of a scary way of putting this. But I, I would just point out is that, you know, a labor union could rent it weekly for four hours and rent a lot of rooms. Now, does that transform into a union hall? You know, if you had uh, a, uh, you know, a, a chemical dependency, uh, you know, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, you know, if they rented out weekly and had a lot of stuff going on in the school. It wouldn't transform the school to the Betty Ford Clinic. It would be, this is a building that gets used. When the Pope had mass in Central Park, it didn't transform Central Park into the Vatican, you know, to St. Peter's Basilica or something like that. So I just think that a, a big event that's temporary, even if it's done on a regular basis, and some of these Boy Scout troops rent a lot of space. Now, they may not rent every classroom or whatever, but they're getting like the gymnasiums or the cafeteria. They're getting the large room in the, and, and, if, and if any, and if there's any school group going on, they're going to walk by and see these other groups using it. So I think that it is, it is, a, a, it is, it is more accurate to look at the big picture of how these schools are being used. They're used by many groups. Some rent a lot of space, some rent little space. There's a lot of school buildings. There's plenty to go around. And uh, uh, and that, you know, I, I, I just think that if you don't have that, then you, you act that the, that the private religious speakers are somehow bad. Now, see, like, you can have, under their policy, a building that's rented for something where, you know, the school board is terrible. Let's have a, we'll have a meeting to talk about how bad the school board is. They could meet regularly every week, rent out a lot of buildings, and it's obvious contrary to the, uh, you know, uh, to the, uh, uh, what the school board is trying to promote, but I don't think that they can say anything different, say, well, no, you know, you, you have to be either neutral or pro-school board in order to meet in our buildings. That would be clearly unconstitutional. And so I, I, I just think that the argument just doesn't, uh, if you think about it, hold up over time. And what it does is say you can gerrymander a form to exclude private speakers in a way. Other uh, comments or questions? Well, I suppose we can go ahead and give a round of applause for one of the Thank you.